Good morning. I'm David Skeel, uh, the chairman of the Oversight Board. I'd like to welcome all of you to this 37th public meeting of the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico, which is being held at the Sheraton Hotel and Casino here at the Puerto Rico Convention Center in San Juan. We'll start out, as always, with a roll call to determine which members of the board are uh, here either uh, on this platform or by video conference. So starting with Dr. Andrew Biggs, are you here? Doesn't sound like he's here at least yet. Uh, Judge Arthur Gonzalez. Oh, hear him. Uh, Mr. John Nixon. I'm here, President. And thanks, John. Mr. Antonio Medina. I'm here, present. Thanks, Antonio. Mr. Justin Peterson. Present. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Dr. Betty Rosa. And I am here as well. So we have a quorum and uh, ex our ex officio member, Governor Pedro Pierluisi. Present. Thank you, Governor. Uh, so we do have a present, uh, we do have a quorum present, and we can call the meeting to order. Uh, as always, I'll ask our general counsel, Mr. Jaime El Cori, if he would act as secretary. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jaime. I'd like to thank all of you in attendance at this meeting in person, and all of you who are watching the live stream of the meeting by the Oversight Board's website, www. Dot oversightboard.pr.gov. Uh, as always, the audio of the meeting is available both in English and in a simultaneous Spanish transla uh, translation, and it is also being translated in sign language. If you log in to the English website, you'll get the English audio. If you log in to the Spanish website, you'll get the Spanish um, simultaneous translation. Um, and as usual, we'll be handling any questions or comments from participants online uh, through the form that's available online on our website. Uh, you can find the form on the live stream page. Uh, what we ask you to do is complete the form with your name and any questions or comments that you may have. Uh, and we'll take comments. Um, up to 15 minutes before the end of this meeting, and we will promptly provide answers to all of the questions or responses to all of the questions uh, later on the, the website. Um, we have uh, a number of public officials uh, here. I saw Secretary of State Omar Morero. There he is. Uh, and we have a number of public officials we'll be introducing as they appear on panels. So thanks to all of y'all for coming. Um, uh, these are obviously very important issues, and what you're doing is, is hugely important. So here are the topics for today's meeting. We'll start with the approval of minutes, both from the last public meeting and from executive sessions between the last public meeting and this meeting. We'll do a couple of administrative matters. I'll give an update. Uh, we'll certify the revised 2022 fiscal plan for HTA. That'll be our first substantive order of business. We'll then have a panel and presentation talking about civil service reform that, that is underway. We will then have a presentation about the pension reserve trust that was created in connection with the Commonwealth Plan of Adjustment. Um, and then we'll take up any other matters we have uh, before we adjourn. So first order of business, or before we adjourn. Uh, first order of business is to approve the minutes of our last public meeting, which was held on July 1 of this year. The proposed minutes are attached to the meeting materials as a, Appendix A. Um, then after that, or then in connection with that, we will approve the exec executive session minutes from executive, executive sessions that were held on July 15, July 25, July 29, August 5, August 7, August 10, August 12, 
August 26, September 2, September 15, September 16, September 23, September 30, and October 13. I think that's a record for executive session uh, meetings, and we'll be approving uh, those minutes. Does anybody have any questions or comments about the, uh, the minutes? Uh, would one of the board members be willing to uh, give a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Uh, thanks. Can you read it? Just the. Uh, oh. Okay. Um, I'd like to move to approve the minutes of the Oversight Board's public meeting held on July 1, attached as Appendix A, the minutes of the executive sessions held on July 15th, July 25th, July 29th, August 5th, August 7th, August 10th. August 12th, August 26th, my birthday, <laughs> September 2nd, September 15th, September 16th, September 23rd, September 30th, and October 13th, 2022, as attached in Appendix B in the form presented to the meeting or with the changes proposed. Thanks, Justin. I'll second. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, so per usual, um, I will take a voice vote. First, asking for all in favor to say yes, then asking anyone opposed to say no, and finally anyone who want, wishes to abstain to abstain. So all in favor, please say yes. 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 We have to hear that. Uh, we have to hear that John Nixon, yes, and we did. Uh, so the motion is approved, uh, and the, the minutes are approved. We now have a couple of quick administrative matters. Uh, when, so uh, one of you be willing to make the next motion? Sure, Mr. Chair. I would like to make the following motion uh, between the adjournment of this meeting and the opening of the Oversight Board's next public meeting, the Oversight Board may consider in executive sessions any and all matters that it is authorized to consider under PROMESA, including one, any certification determination authorized by PROMESA, including certification determinations under Section 206 of PROMESA, two, any submissions or authorizations authorized by PROMESA, and three, any filings authorized under Title III of PROMESA, in each case that are set forth as part of the vote to convene such executive session. The Oversight Board may also act by unanimous written consent between meetings in accordance with its bylaws, with such consent to include consent by electronic transmission. Thank you, Antonio. Do we have a second? Second. second. Uh, thanks, John and Justin. Um, once again, I'll ask for a voice vote. Will all in favor please say yes? Yes. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Any abstentions? That motion uh, carries as well. And we have one more administrative motion. Um, where is this? Oh, I move to confirm and approve the unanimous written consents ad adopted by the Oversight Board since the adjournment of the Oversight Board's last public meeting, which are listed in Appendix C here, too. I second the motion. Thank you, Justin and Antonio. Uh, once again, we'll go for a voice vote. Would all in favor please say yes? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Sounds like we have Judge Gonzalez on as well, uh, in addition to John Nixon. Uh, um, so that, or all, any opposed say no. Any abstentions? And that motion carries as well. Uh, the next order of business we have is a, uh, a short update that I will be giving. Um, the starting point of the update, of course, given uh, the news of, of uh, this week related to our work is that the Oversight Board welcomes the decision by Federal Judge Laura Taylor Swain on Wednesday, uh, which officially confirmed the HTA plan of adjustment. Um, the plan is quite beneficial for the island. It reduces HTA's outstanding debt by more than 80 percent to $1.2 billion and, and will save Puerto Rico more than $3 billion in debt service payments over the life of the plan. The uh, plan enables HTA to exit bankruptcy and enables HTA to make the necessary investments that are needed to maintain and importantly to improve Puerto Rico's roads and other transportation infrastructure. 
Confirmation of the plan is an important step for Puerto Rico to end its bankruptcy process under PROMESA and to achieve long-term economic stability and growth. We also continue to make progress in implementing the Commonwealth Plan of Adjustment that reduced Puerto Rico's, the Puerto Rico government's debt by about 80%. The plan of adjustment for the Commonwealth that Judge Swain confirmed in January and that became effective in March was in many ways a turning point, reducing the government's crushing debt burden um, so that the debt will never be more than $1.15 billion going, um, going forward under the plan uh, and saving $50 billion in debt service payments. But the plan of adjustment was also a turning point in the troubled history of Puerto Rico's public pension system. You all remember that the pension system was almost completely depleted when the oversight board was created. There were $55 billion in obligations, uh, barely $1 billion in assets. Decades of financial mismanagement Underfunding and borrowing from the pension plans left the retirement systems for the central government, teachers, and judges with almost no money at all. Had the Commonwealth not started paying for pensions out of its general operating budget through what is now known as PAYGO, pay as you go, pensioners would have stopped receiving pension checks. With the plan of adjustment, we can be certain that is never going to happen again. There is never going to be um, a risk of that again. The Oversight Board agreed not to reduce the pensions that had already been earned um, by government employees and retirees, despite the fact that there were over $55 billion in debt that had accumulated. But we went further than paying the pensions in full. The plan of adjustment strengthens the pension system by establishing a pension reserve trust to ensure pensions can be paid in the future regardless of who is in power and how the economy is doing. And you'll hear more about those pension trusts later this morning. Retirees have not had any such, such security in the past. The pension reserve trust is projected to re receive more than $10 billion in the next 10 years. Last month, the first payment was set, set aside and put into the pension trust. It was a payment of $1.4 billion from the Commonwealth. We also have made more progress on the comprehensive civil service reform that we're implementing in, in partnership with the government. I'd like to thank Secretary Perez, Directors Blanco and Maldonado, for joining us today and for all of the work that you're doing um, on this really, really exciting and transformative um, project and uh, our Arnaldo Cruz, who is very much involved in that process um, as well. Unfortunately, there also have been some setbacks. Last month, the Oversight Board reached an impasse in mediations with bondholders over the restructuring of PREPA's debt and resumed litigation against uh, the PREPA bondholders. PREPA's debt is the Oversight Board's uh, top restructuring priority. It's the one restructuring that still remains uh, not yet completed. PREPA's bankruptcy needs to end since the restructuring of the debt is a key element in the transformation of Puerto Rico's energy system. This transformation, defined in the fiscal plan and embedded in Puerto Rico law, will provide residents and businesses in Puerto Rico with more reliable, more affordable, and cleaner energy. But we couldn't agree, or we have not yet been able to agree, on the terms to end uh, the bankruptcy. Any restructuring has to be fair to all parties, not just to the bondholders and other creditors, and it needs to assure the long-term viability of PREPA, so PREPA will be a successful, operating, effective company into the future, and it has to be affordable for the people and businesses of Puerto Rico. Although the court-ordered mediation process has been constructive in bringing the parties to the table, the positions on what is reasonable and what's affordable in the context of PREPA's current rates uh, the, the gap between us and the creditors resulted in an impasse, uh, as I mentioned just a moment ago. 
The Oversight Board is fully committed to assuring that Puerto Rico has reliable and affordable electricity. Cost of any debt repayment would have to be, will have to be passed on to the PREPA customers. That's why the Oversight Board has been carefully, carefully analyzing what residents and businesses can afford to pay for electricity. Now, commentators in the past week in particular have been discussing some of the terms uh, of the, uh, the mediation and the various offers that were made public. Um, I'll say only about that that there's an enormous amount of, of misinformation that is uh, floating around uh, about that um, and kind of misinterpretation of what the materials say. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time today um, talking about proposed terms that it is very, very important to emphasize did not lead to an agreement. These are not the terms of an agreement. These are the terms of offers that did not lead to uh, an agreement. It's important to stress this, and I'm not going to speculate now on what the terms of a future agreement might look, at, look like. What I can say is that the, the Oversight Board has been analyzing carefully, as I said a moment ago, what residents and businesses in Puerto Rico can afford to pay and can't afford to pay for electricity. And any restructuring is going to be based on, on that analysis. That, that is what's driving uh, uh, the negotiations from our perspective. Preface debts can't simply be erased as much as people would like to think that they can simply be uh, be wiped out. We're in the United States where there's a rule of law that gives creditors rights just as everyone else um, has rights. What that means is that there has to be a responsible restructuring, but it's a restructuring that is not going to give zero um, to uh, the creditors. That's a restructuring that will be affordable and will create a future for, for PREPA that is sustainable. The Oversight Board believes that negotiations with all parties, not just with bondholders, but with all parties who have a stake in PREPA, can and should be taking place as we are litigating these issues with creditors and about the nature of the creditors' claims. And we are committed to pursuing uh, negotiations <coughs> either in the context of mediation or outside of mediation. We will negotiate anywhere at any time with anyone um, to, to get this done. Uh, the necessity to reach a fair and affordable restructuring agreement for PREPA is, of course, underscored yet again by the tragedy of Hurricane Fiona. The destruction that we've all seen, the flooding, uh, some of us have seen firsthand, others have, have uh, seen secondhand, once again, it's heartbreaking, needless to say, and once again illustrates just how important it is to complete the transformation of Puerto Rico's energy system and to make sure we have a PREPA that works in a way PREPA has not worked in the past. Um, to do this, we need to uh, complete the debt restructuring uh, as expeditiously as possible but we have to complete it on terms that make sense, on, sense, on terms that provide for affordable, reliable electricity. Hurricane Fiona was devastating, and the Oversight Board um, did everything we could uh, to provide immediate support to the government, approving, among other things, the government's uh, request to draw immediately from the Emergency Reserve Fund, which is anchored um, in the fiscal plan and has reached the levels it's reached because of the recent fiscal plans. We also agreed to the governor's request to temporarily exempt sales and use tax on prepared, for, uh, prepared foods. The government, the oversight board has authorized emergency distributions, dis disbursements, of up to $19.5 million to Puerto Rico's municipalities to help support uh, recovery from, um, from the municipality end, and to advance certain uh, municipalities, a total of about $22 million in property tax disbursements to assist with immediate recon uh, reconstruction efforts. My hopes, thoughts, and prayers continue to be with the people of Puerto Rico and to its recovery from this uh, awful disaster, which uh, we've made 
government has made, um, all of us have made enormous progress, but there still is a way to go. And with that in mind, I understand you, that uh, let the, the governor wants, uh, uh, wants to speak first. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. My administration is committed to implementing initiatives that truly set us up to succeed. The people of Puerto Rico deserve that the board and government work collaboratively, collaboratively to address the challenges constraining their daily lives. The government's response to and recovery from Hurricane Fiona's impact is one of those challenges. Let me give an update regarding where we are on those efforts. In the first place, having access to the emergency fund was critical to ensure a swift response to all situations caused by the storm. Pursuant to the board's existing policy, the approval process for the disbursement of these funds must comply with FEMA guidelines for categories A and B of the Stafford Act. With some emergency work still pending, yesterday, OMB Director Juan Carlos Blanco sent the board a request for an additional extension for the use of the emergency fund, and I appreciate that you granted it expeditiously. To date, the government has allocated $73.9 million to emergency and response efforts. Of that amount, nearly $20 million were distributed to all 78 municipalities given that they are our primary first responders. In addition, $12.3 million were used for food and water distribution, $10 million for debris removal, $4.9 million for equipment and heavy machinery, and $4.5 million for generators. Over 8 million water bottles were distributed across the island. 55,000 bags of groceries and supplies were sent to 62 municipalities. Over 8 million gallons of potable water in cistern trucks and 161,000 gallons of diesel were distributed to municipalities, hospitals, emergency centers, and other government entities, and close to 300 generators were provided. At its peak, we had 132 shelters open across the island with 2,198 citizens in 116 shelters. Most citizens had been relocated or were able to return home after the first week and all shelters were closed by October 5th. The Department of Health has already distributed 200 solar generators in affected areas to vulnerable citizens requiring electricity for, for health reasons, and yesterday began the distribution of 200 more, which will ensure resiliency to these families in need. The hurricane had its biggest impact in our, on our electric system, which is in the initial stages of its reconstruction, both in the generation plants managed by PREPA and the electric grid managed by Luma. Luma reported that one week after Fiona hit, it had restored electricity to 50% of its clients. After 10 days, it had restored it to 80% of customers. 91% of them had power by the two week mark. And today, it reports that 99% of customers have power. Our administration continues to oversee Luma to ensure it accelerates its works in every community across Puerto Rico. PREPA's generation plants also suffered significant damages, which required the use of auxiliary plants and mega generators, which are costly. Although sufficient generation was available in the past week, there are additional issues, like damage to the Aguirre and Costa Sur plants, Equelectrica's natural gas terminal, and AES carbon injection system, which are limiting PREPA's actual ability to provide enough generation and causing outages during peak hours. Praza reported that after a week of Fiona's landfall, 80% of its customers had water. After 10 days, it had restored service to 90% of customers. 
95% had water after two weeks. And today, over 99.4% of its clients have service. Prasa is still using 105 generators in its facilities and only about 1,600 of its customers are without water because of power outages. The Puerto Rico Treasury Department estimates that revenue, revenue losses related to income taxes and the sales and use tax could up, add up to approximately $100 million for the month of October. However, because the majority of that revenue loss would come from the postponement of corporate income taxes and the second installment of individual income taxes, it will be recovered in the next few months. Furthermore, as we have observed after other natural disasters, although the economic development growth rate tends to be reduced in the months following the event, a period of rapid growth ensues thereafter, restoring and usually surpassing the losses endured. FEMA individual assistance should also help us mitigate Hurricane Fiona's impact on income tax revenue and my administration, through the Department of Economic Development and Commerce, has allocated $15 million for incentives to small and medium businesses to ensure that they can compensate any losses due to the storm. 2,400 cases have already been approved, totaling $7.2 totaling $7 million in incentives. And FEMA has already approved 503,000 requests for individual assistance and has paid out over $386 million in aid. On the other hand, preliminary estimates point to up to $10 billion in damages and losses. And we're working closely with FEMA to ensure that projects from Hurricane Maria in areas that also suffered damages related to Fiona will be worked on without delay. Actually, because we already have the government structure and experience to deal effectively with the FEMA guidelines, we expect Fiona-related projects to have a more accelerated timeline. These investments will also have a future positive impact in Puerto Rico's economic growth. Finally, I have to say that the Biden administration has been extremely helpful and that we will continue our recovery efforts until all work has been completed. There is no doubt that Fiona, Fiona had a significant impact on our people, particularly those who died, those who lost their homes and their personal and commercial property, as well as those who spent weeks without power or water service. However, we're cl clearly in recovery mode, and every day we're closer to returning our main attention to our infrastructure reconstruction process and our sustainable economic development. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Do you want to say something? Sure. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Governor. I, I commend you for all the hard work and proficiency uh, and echo what uh, uh, our chairman said about the, the hurricane and, and, and our hearts really go out to the people of Puerto Rico. And th thank you for your leadership, Governor. Um, I just want to go back to something that uh, the chairman said about the prepper restructuring and underscore something that I, that I think he was saying, which is that this, this restructuring in conclusion is really essential to bringing about the prepa, the new prepa, the new power system that, that Puerto Rico deserves, uh, one that's cleaner, one that's more reliable, one that's more affordable. Um, I, I would contend that had the RSA been in, been in place five years ago, we'd be in a much better, five years ago had been put into place, we'd be in a much better place today in terms of resilience, reliability, and affordability. That's not the case. Um, and as we continue to work through this restructuring, um, I'm really committed to making sure the bondholders who have been paid nothing for eight years are treated fairly and that we're maximizing uh, their return uh, because they have relent, they forbeared, uh, at every step of the way, and this, this goes to the credibility of, of any state or municipality or territory paying debts. And so, yes, we need to be fair in how uh, the restructuring is allocated, um, and yes, of course, we're, we're taking into consideration 
uh, affordability, but bondholders need to be paid. They should not be the last consideration. Um, and this, this has gone on too long. It's been eight years. Um, this board, there's only three of us here today in person, there's some on the phone, has spent almost a billion dollars of your money since the enactment of PROMESA. That's too much. And I think it's time to wrap these restructurings up so that we can go home and let the elected leaders of Puerto Rico govern Puerto Rico. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Antonio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to briefly add, uh, I do agree that we must get PREPA out of bankruptcy. Uh, the reason that we have outages uh, on a daily, weekly basis, sometimes more than once a day, um, that's not normal. And the reason we have that is because we have a power company that is bankrupt, a power company that owes uh, over $9 billion to creditors and over or around $4 billion to uh, our pensioners, los pensionados. Uh, however, there are some of us in this board that are fighting hard for the people of Puerto Rico. We must achieve a solution for taking out PREPA out of bankruptcy that allows the businesses of Puerto Rico and the people of Puerto Rico to thrive and not be on their undue burden of uh, payments that will make it unaffordable. So I believe that uh, while we have a balance in the board in terms of points of views, the view of the people, it's clearly represented in the board. And there's some of us that are fighting very hard to make sure that uh, the people of Puerto Rico, especially those in need, are not hit with charges that they cannot afford. Thank you, Antonio. And I'll just uh, say that I, agree completely with Antonio's uh, comments. Like Antonio, I, I am fighting as hard as I can to ensure that uh, what PREPA has to pay is affordable for the people of, of Puerto Rico. That's why I'm here. Um, the other thing I'll say is um, we've spent a lot of money on advisors. There's no getting around that, but our advisors have done extraordinarily extraordinary things for the people of Puerto Rico. The Commonwealth restructuring would not have been possible without some of the success we had in litigating creditors' claims. It, it, um, it made a restructuring, a dramatic restructuring, possible that would not have been possible um, otherwise. So it's the best team money can buy. It is. It is a great team, and, uh, and they've been very effective, and they're, they're not quite done yet. Um, so why don't we turn to uh, the presentation of the revised uh, 2022 fiscal plan for HTA, for the Puerto Rico Highways and Transportation. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I, I raised my hand. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't. We can't see you. Sorry, uh, Dr. Rosso. Thank ahead. you. Um, I just want to say that uh, the issue uh, that the chairman raises and the issue that Antonio Gracias uh, for raising the issue about the importance of maintaining the integrity of fighting on behalf of trying to create a balance situation, but always keeping in mind um, el pueblo and always keeping in mind that it is really a situation that we, we want to make sure that at the core uh, we keep in mind that um, the people of Puerto Rico cannot uh, assume the 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 you know the uh, what I would call the biggest issue in this situation in terms of of the debt and and while we understand uh, that you know we're all in this together that we keep the priority to ensure that the um, individuals that economically are just barely surviving are protected and to ensure that that we really create a, an opportunity a situation that is balanced but at the same time protecting la gente del pueblo thank you thank you betty um any anyone else i can't the folks on the phone i can't see your hands 
So text me or, or just uh, or speak up. So um, let's turn to the HTA uh, revised 2022 fiscal plan, which we will be considering for certification. And toward that end, I would like to welcome Alejandro Figueroa, who is the Oversight Board's Director of Infrastructure to present uh, on the proposed revised fiscal plan. Welcome, Alejandro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, board members and Governor Pierluisi. We now present for your consideration the revised 2020 fiscal plan for the Puerto Rico Highways and Transportation Authority, better known as HTA, and thank you. The proposed fiscal plan's revisions are limited in scope, mainly intended to incorporate the operational and financial information necessary to fulfill, fully reflect HTA's recently confirmed plan of adjustment. The Title III Court's confirmation of the plan of adjustment marks an important milestone for HTA and Puerto Rico on its path to successfully emerge from Title III. As we have underscored in the past, Puerto Rico's current transportation system falls behind national standards of quality, safety, and reliability. These deficiencies, coupled with a lack of coordination across transportation modes, have led to limited mobility and accessibility, excessive congestion, and higher transportation costs for the people of Puerto Rico. The proposed fiscal plan for HTA provides a path to our successful transformation of the transportation sector through the implementation of fiscal and operational measures that enable HTA to meet its obligations under the plan of adjustment while making the necessary investments to improve Puerto Rico's transportation network. Along with reflecting HTA's new sustainable debt structure, the proposed fiscal plan further reaffirms the need for a comprehensive reform of the island's transportation sector designed to improve the efficiency with which transportation assets are managed and enable greater investment in the maintenance and improvement projects needed to ensure safe and reliable roads. The proposed fiscal plan outlines the steps HTA must take to comply with its recently confirmed plan of adjustment, like the creation of a toll management office and the funding of various reserve accounts. Moreover, the proposed fiscal plan reflects the benefits of HTA's new debt structure, which reduces outstanding debt by approximately 80% from $6.4 billion to $1.2 billion, and reduces debt service payments to an average of $94 million per year, compared to $294 million prior to restructuring. However, for HTA to sustain the financial, its financial capacity to invest in improving Puerto Rico's roads and other transportation infrastructure while fulfilling its debt obligations, HTA must implement the fiscal measures that have been called for in this and previous fiscal plans, including periodic toll fare adjustments, optimize and enforce toll fines, and, and the pursuit of bi-directional tolling as well as other ancillary revenue opportunities. Equally important, HTA must also undergo an operational restructuring by pursuing the internal operational and financial segregation of its responsibilities over toll and non-toll roads, and the complete transfer of its transit assets to the Puerto Rico Integrated Transit Authority. This effort, known as the Transportation Sector Reform, aims to achieve the necessary operational stability through the creation of asset-specific entities with clearly assigned roles and responsibilities over each asset type. In turn, the shift in responsibility will enable operational efficiencies through effective coordination of investments and management activities across transportation systems. All in, this reorganization will provide HTA with the structural independence required to comply with the plan of adjustment and, perhaps most importantly, provide the Puerto, Ric Puerto Rico citizens with safe and reliable roads and transportation assets. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, do we have any questions or comments? Antonio? I, I just want to comment. This is a huge win for Puerto Rico. Uh, we all know the roads of Puerto Rico are not what they need to eat. We all had, you know, been taking our kids to school and hit uh, un hueco y tener que ir a cambiar la goma porque las carreteras están en un estado deplorable. Uh, it is essential that we get control of the finances of our key institutions in order for the government to be able to provide adequate services to our people, and it includes carreteras. Uh, through this restructuring, uh, we will not have, we now have 
a reasonable level of debt, a very significant reduction in the amount of debt, but, but at a level that is affordable. And while there will be increases over time in the toll costs, those will be uh, attached to inflation because things go up in cost. Now, I would argue that the small increase that we might face over time in toll expenses is really going to be much less than the amount of money we each spend on the maintenance of our cars and uh, the cost, the direct costs that we all experience because of the fact that the roads are not in good conditions. Thank you, Antonio. Um, would someone like to move that we adopt the resolution in the form it, uh, attached as Exhibit 1 to the materials certifying the revised 2022 fiscal plan for HTA? I'll move. Thank you, Antonio. Do we have a second? Second. I'm second. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. <clears throat> Uh, we'll take a voice vote per usual. Will all in favor please say yes? Yes. 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 Any opposed? Say no. Any abstentions? Uh, so the fiscal plan, the revised fiscal plan, is uh, is certified. Well, now, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and Governor Archer. Yeah, I, I heard his. Well, I think we have uh, just. In case folks are one, I think we have six of the seven board members now. We have three on the line and, and three here. And the governor wanted to say a few words. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, there's no doubt that the Title III Court's confirmation of the HTA Plan of Adjustment is another important milestone in our quest for financial stability. The confirmed plan significantly reduces HTA's debt burden by reducing the authority's obligations from approximately $6.4 billion to $1.245 billion, an 80% reduction. Since the Commonwealth emerged from its Title III proceeding, my administration has consistently emphasized the important task of focusing government efforts on Puerto Rico's future economic development. The HTA plan confirmation does just that by allowing HTA to dedicate additional resources to ensuring Puerto Rico's roads and highways are safe and facilitate efficient commerce. My administration is steadfastly committed to working with the Oversight Board to effectuate the HTA's confirmed plan as soon as possible. As satisfied as I am with the confirmed HTA plan of adjustment, I would be remiss if I did not mention the government's disapproval of the Oversight Board's insistence on toll increases in the HTA fiscal plan. If we can achieve more effective revenue generation without the need to impose large toll increases, then logic and duty call on both the Oversight Board and the government to explore other alternatives. In the past, I have already expressed that our differences with the board on certain measures I included in HDA's certified fiscal plan are not in the strategic objective itself, but rather in our approaches on the best way to achieve it. We have based our decisions, decisions on facts, scientific analysis, and the advice of subject matter experts with the best experience and knowledge available. For example, at the beginning of this year, we commissioned a study performed by one of the world's largest independent specialist transportation consultancies on the impact of toll increases and by directionality on our toll facilities. That study was based on, re on the real world conditions unique to Puerto Rico, including the idiosyncrasies of an island that is 100 miles by 35 miles and where the use of interstate highways is more prevalent due to a lack of other non-toll road options in many regions. My administration welcomes continued dialogue with the board to explore every possible alternative to reduce any necessary toll increase for the benefit of the people of Puerto Rico. Thank you. David. Thank, 
Thank you, Governor. Uh, Antonio would like to say something. Thank you, Mr. Governor. Um, I'd like to say that uh, we are committed uh, and willing to uh, evaluate any proposal from the administration that may reduce any impact of this uh, plan of adjustment and this fiscal plan to the people of Puerto Rico. There's absolutely uh, openness from our side to evaluate proposals that will help uh, ease the implementation of this fiscal plan. That said, we all know that material costs and energy costs and uh, you know, labor and human capital costs, et cetera, go up over time. Therefore, we need to work together to ensure that those increases in time, which are natural of the economy, are absorbed adequately by the corporation. Otherwise, we're going to end up in the same place where we were at. By not increasing tolls, we ended up with roads that really did not meet the needs of our economy and our people. Therefore, we look forward to work with the governor and his team uh, to evaluate any proposal that helps absorb those cost increases. However, we do need to be cognizant of the realities uh, and the requirements to keep our infrastructure working in an appropriate manner. Thanks, Antonio. And I'll, I'll just underscore what Antonio said. We, we are open to considering all, uh, all options for minimizing um, cost increases, and that is explicitly contemplated in the, um, in the fiscal plan. Um, all right, so let's move on to uh, the next agenda item for today, which is a presentation and panel on implementation and milestones of the civil service reform that we in the government have been working on together. Uh, civil service reform will enhance the operational capacity across government agencies and strengthen and improve the way the government works for the people. Uh, and I understand that the governor would like to make some remarks on this as well. Would you like to make them now or after the presentation? I can do, do them now, I can make them now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For some time now, the government has insisted on moving away from reductions in the public workforce that were impeding government execution in order to give way to strategic hiring, pay scale adjustments, and a civil service reform. I have always maintained that Puerto Rico needs a comprehensive civil service reform that includes better remuneration for public servants. This is not an issue of simply spending more money. The government cannot be expected to provide efficient services if the salaries of our public employees are not competitive. As I have previously stated, my administration responsibly evaluates all good ideas, including those proposed by the oversight board that benefit the people of Puerto Rico. The civil service reform pilot program was one of those good ideas. And I look forward to hearing from the board staff, Secretary Perez, Director Blanco, and Director Maldonado regarding the implementation of the Civil Service Reform Pilot Program in the Treasury Department, Office of Management and Budget, and Office of Administration and Transformation of Human Resources. It is important to note that if the government and the board are to effectively implement new economic and operational measures that are in Puerto Rico's best interests, we must continue to cultivate the ability to adapt to changed circumstances. While I trust that the comprehensive civil service reform um, will enhance governmental operational capacities and strengthen and improve the way the government works for the people of Puerto Rico, I believe that now that the Commonwealth is out of Title III, it is vital that the Oversight Board respect the elected government's current and future public policy. Constantly changing circumstances require us all to think beyond the confines of the fiscal plan alone. And the people of Puerto Rico deserve to be governed by the individuals they choose to place in office. Simply put, the government needs to be given more of a say in civil service reform proposals. I hope that in the future, we can have serious discussions regarding the government's ability to help define this necessary initiative. After all, the oversight board will not exist forever. 
In the meantime, the board can count on the government to effectively oversee the civil service reforms implementation and milestones. The record shows that when the government and the oversight board cooperate and work together, meaningful change can be achieved. You have my commitment to work cooperatively in the coming months concerning the civil service reform, and I expect the oversight board to likewise engage in serious dialogues with my administration on the matter in order to allow the government to have a more meaningful role in defining the civil service reforms parameters. We look forward to continuing this work. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, and I'd like uh, now to welcome Arnaldo Cruz, who is the Oversight Board's Director of Research and Policy. Arnaldo will be making a presentation to us in Spanish. Um, for those who would like to hear it in English, there'll be a simultaneous English translation. And after Arnaldo's presentation, we'll have a panel in English with the Secretary of the Department of Treasury, Francisco Perez, uh, the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Juan Carlos Blanco, and the Director of the Office of Administration and Transformation of Human Resources, Zahira, Zahira uh, Maldonado. Um, and for that presentation, there'll be a simultaneous Spanish translation. So thanks, Arnaldo. Gracias. Eh, Me escuchan, sí. Good. Yes? Okay. As the chairman has stated, I'm going to be giving my presentation in Spanish, and I will be talking a little about what has been happening with this reform and the implementation of this pilot program, and then we will discuss in a panel in English with the people who have been leading the implementation of this reform. So welcome, Mr. Governor, Mr. Chairman, and all members of the board. Looking forward to this discussion. First of all, we wanted to clarify that this vision of the civil service reform was drawn up in collaboration with the government. And the vision of the reform is to transform the experience of public servants. So it is not a reform to affect public servants, but rather to improve their experience. And by doing so, we improve services and work conditions in every agency. Public employees are the backbone. Employees are the backbone of any organization. And by improving their experience, consequently, you improve the operations and functioning of an entity, in this case, the government. So the reform is not a reform to reduce salaries. It was not established for that purpose. Quite the opposite. It is a reform that is designed together with the government to ensure that public employees will have a competitive salary in comparison with the uh, work mar employment market. All this has been done in coordination with the government of Puerto Rico. It is not a reform to eliminate positions either, On the, quite the opposite. We're working with the government to identify areas that need capital, human capital, and need to add talent in order to help them in the work that is being performed in the agency. So as part of the reform, we're not only looking at pay scales, but also areas of opportunity to add talent in the agencies and help strengthen capital, human, human capital in the government. It's not a reform to to uh, just salaries, as the governor has stated, we are seeking to improve the experience of public servants. And their experience has to do with many factors, not only the salaries that they receive. So what we will see in the pilot is the different components that are being dealt with in the government to improve uh, the experience of public employees within an agency. The reform was designed with these four parameters in mind. First, the organizational structure, which is what establishes where each employee is located, who they report to, what their duties and tasks are, and an employee who is not placed in the proper place, that does not have the proper duties in the, or, or a proper structure, that affects their experience. So part of this reform seeks to assure that uh, the government structures are updated and that the 
people and employees are in the correct structure, the correct place, so that they can perform their duties better. So part of the reform seeks to update the government's structures so that employees can be in the best position to do to perform their tasks and add value to the agency. Compensation, very important. It has been recognized by the board that the pay scales have not been updated in many agencies and for a long time, and employees, as we have seen, and we will be seeing in the pilot uh, program, uh, public employees are being paid on less than what is being paid uh, in general in the work market. So we want to ensure that we do pay them uh, uh, proper salaries pursuant to the market trends. Second, then you can have the proper structure, proper salaries, proper position, but if you don't have the proper talent in line with the needs of the agency, we will not be able to achieve the transformations. So there are some challenges in the recruitment processes to make sure the correct person is being recruited with the correct skills to meet the needs of each agency. So part of the reform includes reforming the recruitment processes so we can bring in the talent that we need for each agency. And the last part, the evaluation of employees. They, they have the proper structure and salaries and uh, placement, but they don't have a way to make sure that the employee can continue to grow and update their skills. And there comes a new evaluation procedure to foster the professional growth of every employee and um, their skills. So these are the four components of this reform. and. It's very comprehensive and complex, and that is why it was decided together with the government to do this as a pilot program. Let's not do this, you know, uh, suddenly throughout the entire government because it is very complex. And so we are going to implement in two agencies as a pilot plan. And then based on the, what we learned from that implementation, then we can expand that throughout the rest of the government. So the reason why we begin with a pilot program it is to be able to demonstrate what is what the correct model we need for the rest of the government where are we in this reform well it's been more than a year and a half now since we have been working with the government this started with the in the Office of uh, Management and Budget and the Treasury Department. And it started with the reorganization and restructuring of the finance and accounting areas in the Department of the Treasury and uh, technological area also, and in the Office of Management and Budget. So that was all redesigned. And all these offices were restructured, all these areas. The compensation was revised, and it was a adapted to the market trends, and uh, that first phase of the pilot program was completed. Then we started reforming the recruitment processes, identified new positions for those new structures that were designed, and the uh, we started the recruitment process to recruit uh, talent, the new talent for these new structures. And then um, to end the cycle, we began a new uh, employee evaluation process. So the pilot program when we when we speak of pilot programs, you know, we always think, oh, that's going nowhere. But actually, in this case, we were able to successfully implement a pilot program in a very complex reform that uh, involves great transformation in these two agencies. And thus, this we have completed this uh, implementation of the plan. The, plan in these four strategic areas. Now we are working with the government and our, the lessons learned, what we did right, what we did wrong, and now working together with the government to design what the model will be to be applied to the rest of the agencies so that it can take effect next year. And that part of the compensation and little by little the other compens components of the reform to apply them to the rest of the government agencies. So we have a long uh, ways, uh, and this has also been thanks to the commitment of the governor and the leaders of every agency for this reform to go from paper to reality in these agencies. We wanted to talk to you a little about what was done in the Treasury Department because uh, we talk about reorganization, restructuring, and what are we talking about? What is what is that? So we wanted to talk not in great detail because there were many changes made as part of the restructure, but there were some challenges in the 
uh, area of the Department of the Treasury that were worked with the Secretary and his team, and that was that their structures had not been updated in a long time. And the structure in the Treasury Department was designed, uh, you know, for the 90s. And this agency has changed. They have lost many employees. A lot of new technology has come in. So we wanted to work with the Secretary and his team to see how we could update the structures and central accounting to our current times and the number of employees the agency has and the technology that it has available. So a lot of the challenges we saw is that there were many structures that were no longer real or necessary anymore. But they were in place and there were employees assigned to divisions, employees working for different areas uh, at the same time. So this affected the supervisory line somewhat. So that uh, was addressed to consolidate and uh, create new divisions, new lines of supervision in the different technical areas. And also, we worked a lot with a problem that we saw in the Treasury Department, which was that accountants and technical positions were dedicating a lot of time to administrative tasks. I'll give you a number. When we were working on this with the Secretary's team, we realized that the accountants, the people in charge of accounting, were dedicating a lot of their time, almost half of their time, to administrative tasks, answering phone calls, emails, and this prevented them from being able to do their work. And so, see, look, and see how a situation in the structure affects the ability of the accountant to do his accounting work. And we addressed this to see how we could improve the structure so the accountant could focus on his accounting work and not focus on administrative things. So many of the changes that were made in the agency were to improve the way um, they operate, all the different components of accounting and finance. So this was a summary. This is a summary of some of the changes that were made. What is important here is that all of these changes in personnel, duties, and divisions, changing personnel from one division to another, creating new units, this does not left on paper, but rather the secretary and his team have begun to implement these new structures to help improve the efficiency and operation of finances and accounting within the agency. So what is important here is that these new structures are implementing, are being implemented right now in Treasury and uh, OMB. Uh, the Secretary and his team have been doing this ever since the new organizational structures were approved. In Treasury, about 78 new positions were approved. There was a need uh, here for accounting positions, technological, technological positions, and when we met with the secretary, he told us many times that there was the need to recruit new personnel. So we identified new positions in accounting, finances, and technology to help strengthen and make the, these, these structures become a reality. So part of the efforts was not to just reorganize, but to identify new positions to bring the department up to date and make sure the secretary would have the resources he needs to comply with the objectives of this agency. In the uh, case of OMB, Many changes were also made in these structures. One of the challenges the OMB had, and we worked with the director and his team, was that there was not a clear division of functions within the budget cycle. And instead, all the processes of the budget be, were being done by one unit practically, and there was no focus on planning, uh, quality analysis of uh, budget processes and this lack of focus affected the ability to work with certain budgetary processes in the cycle because everybody was working on the same thing. So one of the things that we addressed with the director is that new divisions were created. Some employees were moved to those divisions with a new focus within the different components of the budgetary process. In addition to that, in the OMB, there was a public management office, which unfortunately for the last 15, 20 years is an area that was practically abandoned and there were very few employees left there and an area that the director wanted to strengthen, the director of budget. So we created a new structure in the OMB, in the budget office for public management so that there would be this new unit in charge of the work we're doing now. So it, along the lines of the governor, we are very much uh, willing uh, to, 
uh, to forward this to the director, to, to assign this to the director so that he can implement the, these um, new changes that we have uh, addressed in the reform. So we added some new positions, and these are different positions that the government had never had before, data scientists, public policy analysts. analysts. So this is a very um, uh, modern and something that the government of of Puerto Rico needs to do, and all these positions were therefore approved, and uh, the director has started with his team to to recruit new personnel, and with this reorganization work, uh, the director will continue forward with this and will begin in this public agency to work with the different agencies and their reorganization, restructuring, position review, uh, review of operations, and their effectiveness. So we will be working with the director in this transition, and we will uh, hand them uh, over to the director, the transfer of knowledge, so that the office and the director can have the ability to implement this work next year. But this is very necessary in all the rest of the agencies. So in the budget office, about 24 new positions were approved as part of this new organization. And the director is now recruiting all these positions, including the positions for the uh, uh, public public uh, management office, as I mentioned, that will be responsible for the reorganization and restructuring of the government of Puerto Rico. Here we can see the type of positions that were approved and as part of the pilot reform. These are necessary technical positions, but we, they have started recruiting for these positions, onboarding employees. But in the upcoming months, our expectations are that these positions can um, reach the government of Puerto Rico. Uh, to, Weeks ago, we started with this work in the OATRH uh, office, the same work that was done in the Treasury and the OMB. A couple of weeks ago, we started working with uh, Director Mo Maldonado and the reorganization and restructuring of the office. So it's in keeping with the vision of the director and the governor, which is uh, to transform the Human Resources Office, to make it an, a more vanguard uh, office, more updated with different resources, technological resources, data analysis resources. So it will be modernize and we will work with the government to modernize the human resources office so that it can then take control of the implementation of this reform next year with the new resources that it will be provided with. So that is all the work that has been performed in terms of reorganization and in the pilot plan some salary adjustments were made. We wanted to talk a bit about what the methodology was that we used to adjust the salaries of public employees in the pilot program, and that this methodology is what has led us to work with the new uh, compensatory scales together with the government. So what we did was that we looked at all the positions that there were in these two agencies, we reviewed the positions, and saw what was paid in the job market in Puerto Rico, and we did two surveys for this, methodological quantitative surveys, to know what an accountant is paid, uh, what a programmer is paid in Puerto Rico in the private job market. Once we did that, we compared the salary that the person has now with what is paid on the market, and that is how we determine the employees who were being paid below what is paid on the job market and those who were being being paid more. And the ones who were under what was paid on the job market were, received the salary adjustment in the pilot program. On these two tables, you can see the real data of how these salaries were for public employees in the pilot program, both the Treasury and OMB, uh, in relation to the market. This line that you see here, the black line, establishes if the employee... Okay, I'll, I'll go slower, no problem. And oh, and I thought I was speaking slowly, but apparently not. Oh, the translation? Oh, that's right. Okay. So this line that you see here, it establishes whether the employee was uh, being paid in, in keeping with the Puerto Rico job market. If it's underneath, that means that it has a salary that is below the standards of the Puerto Rico job market. Um, this was not general. This was for each position. Uh, they each, each area has a different uh, pay a salary. And these here were the ones who were receiving a salary below uh, 
the job market, both in the Treasury and OMB. In, in Puerto Rico, 73% of employees were below the competitive benchmark. I think that is what... He made like an initial estimate based on his knowledge. And what is important is that we prepare this information with data from the market and we use scientific methodology to validate that in fact they were below the uh, competitive benchmark. But it, it's not so much that, it's how far below the competitive benchmark they were. They were not equally under the competitive benchmark. Some were closer to the benchmark and others were above it. Look at this employee over here and look at the difference between that person's salary and what the market pays. So what we did was, and look at uh, the OMB, it was 80% the difference. The difference between the Treasury and OMB is that besides the fact that the OMB had a higher percentage of employees, the variance, the difference between their current salary and market salary was greater in the Treasury Department. So the difference in the Treasury Department was greater, even though it was a higher percentage of employees in the OMB that were below the competitive benchmark. So what we did in the pilot program is that all employees who were below the benchmark were brought up to here, to this point, both in the OMB and the Treasury Departments. Obviously, in the pilot program, the ones who were here did not receive an adjustment. The 20%, 20% here, and 27% over here. So if we had uh, taken on an approach of giving not 3% or to everybody, what would have happened? This one up here would have received 2%, and this one also 2%. And what would happen if we give 2% to everybody? Then this one will go up a little and will continue to be far from market trends, and this one will continue to be more uh, further. So to uh, achieve some uh, conformity in the government, you know, in the government, each agency has its own compensation uh, plan, and this causes differences between the agencies. So some accountants in some agencies are, are paid a salary, and others a different salary in another agency. So using the scientific methodology to, to implement the adjustments in the pilot program, when we did these adjustments, in the end, no employees in the Treasury Department or OMB were being paid uh, outside the, uh, mark, the job market. And this is the vision of the government to make sure that no employee is below the um, job market in Puerto Rico. And so we identified the positions. Perfect. As part of the recruitment reform, how did we recruit? The government has had a problem with recruitment, a very serious problem, and this is due to many factors. The scales, the difficulty a person has to recruit. And one of the things that we did, and this was led by Director Maldonado and her office, we created a new digital platform, and for the first time ever, any person who wanted to apply for work with the government could do so through a digital platform at the central level. In the past, you had to go to the agency and in the investigative or research process. We uh, applied in different agencies and never called us back and uh, because there was no way to create this uh, record digitally. So this centralizes and facilitates the process of applying for work with the government and also achieves transparency because you're creating a digital record of the application which, you, which was not done in the past. So this platform that is part of uh, the innovative initiative of the government facilitated uh, the process of applying for work with the government of Puerto Rico. And CIDA, it's now it's 7,000, right? So this is an old number, you see. So the number of applications the government has received had, had never been seen before, and uh, because we thought, you know, we didn't expect that so many people would actually apply, and the numbers have actually passed all expectations. And what is more important, I would like to show you the positions in the Treasury Department and OMB. In the Treasury Department, the, sec the secretary was having a hard time recruiting c accountants. Sometimes the applications were not received, somebody, nobody would show up, and now there's a good problem. We have too many people applying for work with the government of Puerto Rico. In this position of accountant, we need seven uh, entry-level accountants. 
more than 100 job applications were received. These positions, which are very technical for financial accountants, new positions were created so that we could work with the uh, financial statements of the government that the secretary needed. So these are accountants that uh, need to meet higher requirements, and so new positions were created to be able to recruit such particular uh, talent with a certain experience and uh, level of uh, competency. And look at the numbers here of people who have applied for these positions. Now the secretary has a good problem, and he has to handle all these applications, and we now have to create the capacity, technological capacity in the government, and we will be working with the director and the government to facilitate the analysis of these applications because nobody expected so many people to apply. Look at these um, data scientific uh, scientist positions, these new positions that we're trying to bring into the government. Uh, almost 25 people applied to for the uh, data scientist uh, position, which had never existed in the government of Puerto Rico before. In, to analyze the public policy. There, so there's demand and there are a lot of people who want to work for the government, which was good news. And it shows that this uh, pilot program and the technology and new positions that are being created is generating this interest and allowing the agency to have a pool of candidates that it needs to recruit the best talent in Puerto Rico. Okay, the evaluation system. This was very important and this uh, was designed in conjunction with the government uh, the governor, and uh, this is what are we going to evaluate? This was the first decision of design. Are we going to evaluate employees? What are we going to evaluate? There was an intention to evaluate performance at the outset, but then what happened? First, the government had uh, infra data infrastructure problems to evaluate performance in the agencies. So you can, right now, you can't see performance in the area, but you want to see the employee performance. There's going to be a disconnect between the employee and the agency performance. So we needed to strengthen the infrastructure of data so that the agency had its indicators of performance, and then you can add that, uh, uh, you can use that for employee performance. Uh, the, the other thing we saw is that when we did, did the initial analysis of skills that employees have in Treasury and OMB, we saw there were great big uh, skill gaps and mastery of skills. It wasn't the employee's fault necessarily because the average years of a Puerto Rico government employee is 25 years. So these employees were contracted uh, 22 years ago. So the government uh, historically has not done a good job of updating their skills. If I was contracted uh, uh, 22 years ago as a programmer is what I'm programming now. So many of the these jobs in the technical areas uh, have helped us to update these uh, so that when we evaluated skills, there was a great a big gap. So we're going to talk about employee uh, skill uh, skills when they don't uh, have them. Uh, we took the decision in consensus with the government. We're going to evaluate employee, evaluate employee skills and see what are the gaps, not to punish, not to uh, make findings, but rather to invest in them and give them the tools so that they can then perform. This was a decision uh, that was taken jointly with the government uh, to evaluate skills. So the system was inaugurated, the employees were and supervisors were evaluated, and their skills were evaluated, and the system created visual data visualizations which allowed each agency to, to know what the skills are, where we see the most gaps. It's not no good to evaluate employees if we don't have data intelligence in terms of where to invest. So this system that we inaugurated identifies the gaps, as you can see. This is real data. The largest skill gaps by agency. Also, we created visualizations so that the agency can see where the gaps are poor by area. And uh, as you know, an agency has departments and divisions. We created visualizations 
visualizations so that the secretary can see a dashboard, a visualization of what the departments are and where the biggest gaps are. What are the skills that are most problematic uh, centrally, uh, accounting, technology, etc. So we have these visualizations which now allow the secretary and the HR department of the agency to know where to invest versus investing uh, where we've evaluated. We, we don't know, uh, we don't have the data. Uh, the system uh, develops the intelligence to uh, pinpoint where to invest in ca human capital. Here we have the dashboard given to each supervisor, uh, which allows them to see where the skill gaps are for their employees and what are the skills gaps that each employee has within uh, the staff. And this gives the supervisor the ability to invest and help their employees. This is received by uh, each public employee. Um, these are your skills. Uh, these are your areas of opportunity. Uh, it's not to punish. It's not to <coughs> make findings. Nothing punitive, but rather, what are which of these uh, are areas of opportunities in which you might want to invest? So each employee received a visualization or dashboard, and then met with their supervisors, and the employee and the supervisor chose the three areas that uh, they want the agency to invest in for professional development. So not only are they given the visualization in terms of opportunity, but they have the employee has the opportunity to choose where they want to invest. So once the employees went into the system and chose the three areas for investment, uh, they decided, uh, well, okay, now we know what each employee wants, so how do we match the offer? And sorry, I know I talk about demand and supply a lot. It's can't, this can't be avoided. Uh, well, we see the demand. What do employees need? How do we supply uh, this? What, what's the offering or the supply? The courses. This was the pilot. Uh, we're st uh, we've got a new digital platform called e-learning where it's got a ca course catalog in various areas and topics. And this platform was purchased to provide it as the pilot and we're doing a matching of the areas each employee chose. The areas chosen by each employee uh, matches with the course catalog uh, that uh, the catalog has, and uh, this was already done. Uh, we've done an analysis, and each of the employees by, by th for each of the three areas has what we call a learning path. This is a learning area, and each of the courses are pre-selected, and uh, when they log in, uh, they're going to be able to take their courses next on that next week uh, in their areas of opportunity. So this is digitalizing and making an automatic, individualized professional development uh, uh, path using this system of as the system for evaluation. This is quite modern, and. It's Vanguard here in Puerto Rico using technology and data to individualize and invest in public employees. Uh, here we're innovating uh, in a lot in uh, evaluation and uh, uh, employee training. Uh, yeah. yeah. Here we have a challenge, Governor, uh, where we see what the, where the agencies need to improve uh, in finance and accounting. We found a lot of challenges, and in Treasury, so imagine the Department of Family and Health. This is an area where we'll be investing a lot in data uh, analysis and evaluation in con accounting and finance, but we have the pre-selected courses, which will go directly to the employee, and the employee can then take their own time. Uh, this is, uh, there's an empowerment here uh, f for the employees in terms of their learning. Okay, the next steps. I'm wrapping up now. So the pilot is done. And obviously, uh, I'm going to congratulate the governor because it wouldn't have been possible without the three people who are here, the governor, uh, Juan Carlos, Francisco Perez, and Saida. Uh, they've been key in all of this, and I very much appreciate uh, and I'm thankful to them and their team uh, who have been working with our team uh, every day. Here we have the pilot. Uh, what's next? 
we've got the compensation scale. That's that's what comes next, right? Uh, it draws a lot of attention. What are we doing? Well, we have already implemented uh, the this benchmarking in the pilot. It worked. The government accepted it and said, "Hey, we want to pay market. So let's do this. Use the same methodology for other." work, other jobs. Let's develop new compensation scales. We're going to put out the positions and uh, we're going to put the employees on the new scales and we'll do an impact analysis uh, uh, for which uh, w to see where each employee is eligible for an increase and then uh, the employees will be notified. So all of this work will be taking place between October and January and we're working day to day, hour by hour uh, with D Director Maldonado and others to have these new scales and these structures to uh, have the employees in January uh, with these new compensation scales. And we're also working with the government in terms of how we're going to expand the reform, not only the scales, but uh, employee evaluation, recruiting, organization. How do we expand this to the rest of the government? And the governor, I will assure you, all of these decisions are being taken jointly with these people who are here and they can validate this. This has been a co totally collaborative job uh, and many of the things we've done have come from their suggestions and ideas from the executive team. How do we develop, the last thing I'm going to mention, uh, these uh, salary scales. The first thing, we want to know what uh, the government and government's vision is. How do they want to pay? How does the government want to pay? So we did these workshops with the government and uh, um, the governor's mansion team and others, and we could see the government's vision as to how to pay the public employees. The other thing is to do the benchmark analyses, uh, the market benchmark uh, analyses, and then we join these and we create the new salary scales. What is the philosophy uh, that was defined by the government? government and uh, this government uh, goes in line with the modernization of uh, public service to pay the government's vision is that we pay competitively and we're on the same in the same page uh, it's very important for employees to have competitive salary salaries according to the labor market uh, rewards there's a vision uh, that they be compensated for work well done Wow, the thing here is that the trend in human resources is to use small rewards, but it is recognized, but, but, but to indeed recognize when the employees are going the extra mile or completing uh, extra projects, there will be additional compensation. This is going to be brought on board little by little, and we're going to have a new poli policy with the government to give po bonuses for exceptional work or that which goes beyond the minimum requirements requ uh, of the job. So there is a commitment at some point in January we're going to be working on this and launching that new rewards policy, hot jobs. This means means that the government can have the flexibility for certain jobs which are hard to recruit for uh, to pay a little above market value at times where uh, it's hard to recruit for a certain job. It's very modern and advanced. Uh, there's a commitment uh, there for the government to have flexibility for certain positions. There needs to be equity, but it needs to be recognized that if there's a programmer that needs to be paid more, uh, we need to make sure we don't uh, drop salaries for anyone, but uh, ra rather uh, if we've got to pay more. Uh -huh. But you don't want to create a, a large disparity between uh, employees at a same agency. So the philosophy of the government is uh, there. There, there need, wants to be. A, there needs to be a lot of communication, uh, and we need to foster employee growth and ensure that employees are not, are not in the same position, uh, uh, which is what we see a lot, uh, where we have employees in the same position for 20 years. They haven't changed. 20 years. This can't be. 
We need employees to grow. If I come in as an analyst today, uh, I need to be able to be a senior analyst within three years. There needs to be a career path or career progression. It's very important. Uh, there, we don't see that right now, and we have employees right now who have been in the same job for 20 years. This has got to be addressed as well, So, and we'll be, we'll be doing so. And there's got to be discretion in the agencies. Uh, uh, where the ATH uh, has the uh, flexibility to determine where it needs to be above. Uh, uh, there's got to be that discretion. Uh, it's got to be, go, but it's got to be authorized. That's the government philosophy. philosophy. Uh, we captured this after several workshops with the governor, so now we have this. And the other thing remaining is we're going to do the benchmarks, right? The benchmarking is uh, the positions, market, how much does the market pay, so that we can have scientific data regarding the classification system data. How was this done? There are 1,500 categories or classes in the report system. Uh, we obviously couldn't benchmark 1500 because we would be here until who knows when and we wouldn't fulfill the we wouldn't meet the goal so we did an analysis with the government in terms of seeing how many benchmarks we need to do to able to to have a good number to um, build a new salary scale so what we did was the system has a lot of classes without employees so we reached this number of 350 350 classes that need uh, data, market data, so that we can use this as a basis to build the scales. So this show, this uh, sample of the 350 classes, which is 90% of employees, and then with this, uh, we've already collected all the data uh, from the two surveys that are being used uh, to know market salaries. The next thing that was done was to go to each of these positions. How do we do a benchmark? Well, we have to do, this is not a, like a crazy, uh, you, you can't do this just uh, uh, without really planning this through. We went one by one and did a matching, not with the a job title, uh, but we need a uh, the description uh, and compare this to the database uh, to ensure that we have the correct class and that we're bringing the correct data from the database. And once we did this match up, we took the data from the market and used this as a basis to build the scales. So this was a very tedious uh, job, but we've already achieved this. So we've. Uh, got a sketch, a uh, draft of the uh, scales, and now we're working on uh, a modern scale. Uh, it's it's uh, not like what the federal government has. We're modernizing the scale to give the government flexibility, and we're already working on uh, putting the 1,500 classes in each of these Agree, uh, degrees uh, or grades, and uh, within the three or f next three or four weeks, we expect to have the preliminary analysis of the budgetary impact of the new scale. Uh, this is ongoing. It's very technical, tedious, but there's commitment from the governor and the board to do this scientifically using data and to give this to the government of Puerto Rico. Uh, this is something everyone needs to have uh, within the government for a new and uh, advanced government. Uh, and we want to again thank uh, these uh, people. We have Yamil representing the governor's mansion. Uh, and I know uh, they've, they've, the governor and Yamil have been essential in this, and they've been working with us in this entire process. And I really appreciate the governor's mentions uh, so support and uh, the director Juan Carlos Blanco and director Maldonado have been key in having this go from theory to what's, uh, what can be implemented and it's now having an impl impact and giving us a model we can replicate to transform the rest of the government of Puerto Rico. And with that preamble, I'm going to now switch over to English because you've been listening to me for the last, I don't know, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. I don't know, uh, it wasn't an hour, right? Uh, that was the goal. 
So now I want to switch to English so that we can have a panel with the budget director and the transformation office director and the secretary Paris to talk about uh, their experience with the implementation of this platform. ready to switch to the panel and um, we'll wait. We need pasar al panel. El gobierno se acercan a, a, la, a, la, a la tarima y comenzaremos el conversatorio. Eh, ya, ya está. Muy bien. So we'll switch to uh, English. Uh, uh, Governor, I don't know if you want to say some words or Chairman Skill before the panel or we'll wait until the panel is done or you're good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank yeah, you very much for your good. presentation, Arnaldo. All right. So, uh, Zaira. I know. I know. Saida wanted to uh, be in, in the middle. Yeah. Let me get this up on one. Maybe here, right? Okay. 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 All right. So. All right. So um, we have here. Uh, leaders of the uh, government that have really made this reform possible. So I wanted to start with uh, Francisco Perez, the Secretary of Hacienda, who I know at the beginning, Secretary, you have some concerns about this reform. And, you know, and we, we started working, you know, we worked some of those concerns out, but I wanted to, um, to ask you about your experience uh, so far with this reform and how what 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 do you think changed in the way of you know how you proceed to reform at first and how the reform has actually uh, been implemented? Well, basically, my my main concern and at first uh, uh, let me introduce myself to to the to the board and apologies for my English. I'm from Morovis and my English <laughs> is not as fluent as as others, but certainly I, I'm gonna do my best effort on 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 that aspect. Well, my, my main concern was basically that we were only considering the financial aspect of uh, the, the Department of Treasury. And we were uh, leaving out the, I think, one of the most important aspect, which is the tax revenue operations. So this, this will represent two challenges. The external factor that we'll still have some jeopardies in the tax co collection uh, efforts. We we'll still have need more people, even though that we have been able to actually uh, make some uh, transformation processes in in the in the department uh, through the SURI and through the digitalization process. We are still in need of of more uh, headcount uh, in in the tax revenue aspects. From an internal standpoint, I think the biggest challenge was how we are gonna deal with employees which are doing very te technical uh, jobs in the in the department that were not included in the pilot so this represents a cultural uh, challenge how to manage expectations from our uh, employees within the hacienda and obviously my main concern since the beginning in 2017 when i joined the department of, uh, of treasury is how we are going to be able to make a more effective tax collection efforts through our people, having more personnel within Hacienda, the tax audits, the tax services, uh, the processing of, of tax returns, the orientation that we need to give to, to our people, our outreach programs. I, uh, I still believe that we need to actually uh, revamp those areas so we can improve the, the quality on the tax uh, implementation and, and collection efforts. So what, what has been the reaction from some of the employees that, that have been part of the pilot? That, what, have they gone to you and said, giving you some feedback or what, what some, some uh, maybe uh, experiences you have had with some of the pilot employees? Well, basically most of the, of the COBRA employees, they are extremely happy that finally we have done something. Uh, the last uh, reform that was implemented in Hacienda was in, in 1994. So we were dealing with a, a salary base 
on 1990s. So definitely uh, this was pretty much fair and uh, an obligation from the government of Puerto Rico to retribute to, to our, our people. However, uh, I think from the uncovered personnel, uh, I think they have still hope that we are going to be able to implement something that actually makes a more fair system within within Hacienda. And this will be shown once we implement this, uh, this will be shown in, in the services that we provide to, to our people and our taxpayers, uh, specifically in the tax ser services areas, uh, the outreach programs, the orientations, and, and other aspects which are critical and key for for an effective tax administration, I think they, they are going to be positive, positively affected when, when we finalize this process. Hey, thank you, Secretary Perez. Hey, Juan Carlos, I wanted to ask you, um, because you're the Office of Management Budget, so one would think that the Office of Management Budget doesn't need any re reorganizing or restructuring because that's what the office does. So wh why do you think it was necessary for the office that is responsible for this type of work in other agencies to be able to go through a reorganizing itself. Why, why, why do you think that was important? Well, uh, thank you, Arnaldo, and, and first of all, good morning to board members, uh, governor, and, and everyone in the audience. Uh, I would first uh, uh, thank uh, Arnaldo and, and the team that has been working with us on the civil service reform, as well as the budget team from from the from the fiscal board, because without resources, we wouldn't be able to, to do this. So uh, it's not only looking at our structures and how we modernize government, but also doing it in a fiscally responsible way. So uh, that collaboration has included many other parts. Uh, to your question, uh, why was it important to restructure our OMB, our, our office? Uh, because it hadn't happened. Uh, uh, one of the areas uh, when the board came in and in, in, into, in, started its mandate, uh, was precisely taking over the budget process. And we had to start, when we start thinking about the post PROMESA government, we had to make sure that the Puerto Rico government had the resources, and had the people uh, with the right classification and the right task, uh, right compensation, uh, the right uh, path to develop professionally so that we can manage our finances and our budget moving forward once the, the board concludes its mandate. Also, I think that uh, when people come to my office and come to, uh, to talk to our staff, they only think in terms of, of numbers. And you know, I, I need uh, additional, uh, more money, more budget for, for my office, but we do have the management responsibility. And I think that uh, it, the way to make the best use of every single dollar that we have allocated in our, in our budget is through better management. Public management is critical moving forward for everything that we want to do. So we had to strengthen that function. We had to make sure that the government of Puerto Rico had an office, had a function, had people who are looking every day seriously at how we can do things better, how we can measure what we're doing, how we can use data, how we can use technology to make sure that the government of Puerto Rico not only does this project, and I don't think uh, we're talking about this the other day, this is not a project with a beginning and an end. There are certainly some milestones that we have to hit through the process, but true success for the civil service reform is a change of culture, a change of the way the government of Puerto Rico thinks of itself and how employees think about their responsibility inside government. So that's why it was really important for the Office of Management and Budget and for Treasury and now with uh, OATRH to be at the center of this reform. Great. Uh, Saida, in your case, you have uh, the task, the difficult task, of developing a uniform uh, class system and a uniform um, retribution plan. Why was, it, why, why was it so important to centralize and unify pay in the government of Puerto Rico? Good morning, Arnaldo. Good morning, all our members and the governor. Thank you for the opportunity and good morning to all the audience members. Um, well, w one of the mandates of Act 8 2017 is precisely that. The government sh should centralize all the aspects that pertain to classification and remuneration of our public employees. Why? Because, as you previously stated, the agencies, some of them hadn't revised and uh, 
modernize their pay scales and their class systems, and as such, we had different agencies with different classifications and different pay scales, e even for employees that were doing essentially the same functions. So that didn't allow the government, certain agencies who had less budget, to retain its employees, and they would sort of pirate employees from each other, and, and that didn't um, further uh, good administration. So um, part of the mandate, as I said, was to uniform all these pay scales and to revise them uh, so that we can be competitive with the private sector. So that's why we looked at salaries in uh, the private sector employees so that that way wouldn't, we wouldn't keep losing employees uh, who maybe wanted uh, better remuneration and also to transform our human resources. It's in the title of Act 8 2017. And this has been a whole transformation, not only of the pay scales, but also to further develop our employees when it comes to their training, when it comes to the resources and the tools that they need to better perform their jobs. Great. Uh, Secretary Perez, I, I, I know that you, when we talked at the beginning, um, through that initial meetings that were very interesting, um, <laughs> we share our, our our common our, our common vision and our differences. Um, what what has, in your opinion, what has surprised you the most about the implementation of the reform? Because I know you 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 said that you you know you knew that these things were a reality, but was there something that you were like, wow, that that was a surprise? Oh, I've been surprised that the people that was uncovering the pilot program hasn't made a strike in Hacienda. <laughs> so that's something that that I appreciate from from our uh, employees, something that I truly appreciate, and hopefully we can continue this in an expedite fashion so we can implement this once and for all and move to bigger and better things for the Department of the Treasury and obviously for the, for the taxpayers. Uh, in, in your case, uh, Juan Carlos, this, I mean, this new public management unit, I mean, we, we spent hours designing this. This wasn't like, Governor, this wasn't like you know a bunch of consultants doing little drawings, and we went and this is what you need to do. Like we spent like three days with Juan Carlos just workshopping this, and what you see there is the result of his vision for the public management. And what we did was just from a technical aspect, just provided support. So can you talk about the vision of that new public management office area and what, what why is that so important for? the transformation of Puerto Rico? It, it, it is critical, and I, I mentioned the post-PROMESA uh, concept, the post-PROMESA government, and I say this with the utmost respect for board members and, and staff present, but part of my job is for you to, to finalize your mandate, for, for you not to have a job, basically. So it, it, in, uh, in order for us to, to be able to do that, we have to be ready, and, and we have to make sure that some of the good things that have happened uh, uh, from, from the board uh, inserting itself in, into Puerto Rico and identifying the areas that we have to be honest, we were not doing right, that we learned from the process and that we, we implemented that uh, permanently in the government of Puerto Rico. So the, the fact that we're talking about data scientists, that we're talking about people who we want to be there, whose job is going to be find out how, to, how can we collect data and how we can turn that data into action, in, into plans, into forward thinking, into making sure that government is working right today, but that we're also anticipating what our needs are gonna be tomorrow. And obviously how that translates into how we allocate our resources, how do we budget. If we bring those things together from the management perspective and from the budget perspective, we're gonna be able to do even greater things that we're doing right now. Puerto Rico, the, the decision-making process in Puerto Rico has been uh, haphazard over the last 20, 30 years. We have to create this unit. We have to provide the government and the people of Puerto Rico because ultimately, you know, this is really not about government. This is really not about us. This is about the people that we're tasked to, to serve, the people who every day depend on us on doing our good, a good job. And, and part of, of what we need 
to do that, that job is information, and, and information that is actionable, information that's useful, and then the tools and the mechanism to uh, bring that, the, those decisions and that information into a better government. So, so that's why it's critical. So I, obviously, in order to transform the two agencies, we need new talent, right? And, and not that the talent that's there is not good enough, it's just it's not enough, right? Um, and there's, the workload has increased, more difficult technology. So it's not just that we need more people, we need different type of people to, uh, in, to integrate with the existing folks, right? Not that we wanna replace the existing folks. So um, where, where you, and then I'll ask Saida, but I wanna ask the two of you, um, uh, Juan Carlos and, 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 and uh, Secretary Perez, were you surprised about the number of people who, apply, who are applying for these jobs? I mean, were you expecting a lot of people? Were you expecting, I mean, how, uh, I mean, just talk about that experience of dealing with all these applications. No, it, it didn't surprise me because since I joined the Hacienda, we have been trying to uh, improve how people perceive our agency. And the trust from our colleagues within the government, the trust from the, from the governor, but also the trust from the people. And I think we have been able as a team to actually improve how uh, Hacienda has been perceived. And this comes also with the, with the specific uh, benefit that more people wants to join an agency that has been improving its processes and improving its view and its mission uh, across the years. And hopefully uh, we can recruit the best talent as possible. I guess that the, that the next challenge after this recruitment process is how to maintain uh, this new generation. Uh, as a matter of fact, the youngest gener generation, they are uh, more bound to change from jobs in a in a more continued fashion so i guess from a recruitment perspective in the government of puerto rico we have to uh, we need to improve our recruitment process to be as dynamic as possible because now it's it's very uh, it's not going to be uh, uh, the same path in the in the public service for these new generations i, I don't foresee personal staying 30 years, 40 years in the, in the government. I think many people wants to join, wants to have their, their limited path in the government of, of Puerto Rico, but then move to other things in life. And, and I guess that from our recruitment perspective, we need to, to move to those challenges as well. And we need to have a more dynamic rec recruitment process. And, and this pilot program will help us to have a, a better uh, resources and tools to actually provide provide that that need for the government of Puerto Rico to actually uh, be able to to work with these new generations. Juan Carlos, well, in your case, you you have some very odd positions um, that were not as traditional, right? And, and you, you mentioned data scientists, public policy uh, experts, or design experts. So they were not your typical government jobs. So. I think, I know we were talking about before launching that, we were concerned <laughs> if we were gonna get some resumes, but the response has been very significant. Were you surprised with those particular jobs? I, I am, I, I, I actually was surprised. I, I think first of all, uh, w when we have these discussions about government and, and especially here in Puerto Rico, we tend to fall in, into the trap of the, of the simplistic number games without context. This is really not about adding or subtracting uh, uh, employees into the government. It's, again, putting the right people in the right situation with the right job, right compensation. This is about the government of Puerto Rico being a competitive employer in the marketplace. Here in Puerto Rico, and quite frankly, in the whole United States and the, the world, I mean, we're competing with other jurisdictions. When we talk about, for example, we're, we're using, uh, when we're losing teachers, we're losing police officers, we're not necessarily losing them to jobs here in Puerto Rico or losing them to jobs nationwide. So, so, that, so that's uh, one thing. The other thing is that we have to earn back the trust of the people. And, and Secretary Perez mentioned the new generations. We have to earn particularly the trust of the new generation. Don't see government necessarily as a career path 
or, or a, as a step in their personal and professional development. It, it's, it's really cool to work in government. Uh, you, you, you do have the opportunity to do great it, things. It is cool. It is cool. I, 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 I mean, I've, I've, I've had the, 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 the privilege of working both in the private sector and in government. And, and I can tell you that there are uh, as uh, certainly as challenging uh, opportunities in the government, particularly in the government of Puerto Rico. And there are many, uh, uh, you don't have to be here for 30 years. You can come in and do a project or, or work in, 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 in you know, one area and contribute, but also learn and grow professionally and, and move forward to, to in, in your career. So I, I think it's, it's part of the responsibility to create that flexibility, to create those spaces to create those exciting opportunities to have young people, you know, people who are, are you know, a different generation who view the world differently to come and, and contribute. And, and that's why, you know, one of the, the, the good things that are coming out of this process is that by making the Puerto Rico government a competitive employer, we're going to bring those opportunities to, to our market. So, Saida, you as the leader of this uh, new uh, platform, like, were you surprised? I'm going to give a little background, if I may. When, I, when the governor appointed me uh, a little while ago, um, one of the first things that he told me was that uh, the government needed a better uh, recruitment platform. And um, that was one of the main goals of this administration, to facilitate and promote the recruitment of new talent. Um, in case you didn't know, Prior to launching, and I'm going to plug it in as many times as I can, empleos.pr.gov, empleos.pr.gov. Prior to that, all we had was basically a search engine where potential candidates or applicants could just search what, uh, where they wanted to be, um, but it didn't allow for people to apply. So uh, this past summer, with the governor and all the parties that, that are here, we launched um, empleos.pr.gov so that interested uh, people could finally apply. And to your question on whether I'm surprised, yes and no. Yes, because certainly the volume has been impressive. And this is just hot off the presses. We are now at 7,579 job applications as of this morning. And that's certainly quite impressive, knowing the sense that um, I think this shows that the, the people are willing and are wanting to contribute to the government uh, being part of it and being part of the progress undertaken by this administration uh, to better the quality of life of everybody here in Puerto Rico. So yes and no, it certainly has been, um, it's a good it's a good problem to have, like you said, to have so many job applications. So it's certainly a challenge that we're gonna undertake on um, very, very enthusiastically. Thank you, and they told me that I need to wrap up. Um, so I, I do want um, to give all of you some final words um, about this process, this reform, um, what this, this initiative, this collaboration, this pilot has meant to the government and to the future of, of the government as well. So just a reflection, a quick reflection on, on this past year, or year and maybe so, almost a year and a half of work uh, from your end. So we'll, we'll start with you, Secretary Perez. Any reflection on the last year of work, hard work with your team and, and this reform? This is one of the things, and back when governor was governor-elect, we had a conversation in, in November 2020 after the, the election about the Department of Treasury and we talked about, uh, we talked much about the employees and how important it, it was the public force. And that's one of the main reasons that I uh, felt honored of from his opportunity to stay uh, in, in the Department of Treasury uh, that finally, we were changing the views of austerity within our uh, employee headcount and employee benefits and having a governor that w was going to be able to push forward a reform within the government that actually allows to empower the public employees and my people and my friends and, and my family within Hacienda. 
it's something that actually maintain a fire within me to, to stay until we can uh, actually finalize this, this process in, in Hacienda. It's one of the three biggest tasks that I have on, on hand as a Secretary of, of Treasury to actually complete the transformation of, of Hacienda. I need from, from the people and having the back uh, um, or, or the backup from a governor it's something that actually simplifies uh, this, and that's something that I, I reflect all all days in my life. With when I join the the building in Hacienda, uh, it's having someone that that can have uh, the power and, and the trust, and obviously uh, the the intention to 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 make this a, a better workforce within within Puerto Rico. And this goes beyond the public service. This affects uh, all people uh, within Puerto Rico. And I think that at the end of the day, we will have a, a better government than the one that I, I, I joined back in 2017. I'm, I'm pretty darn sure of that. Uh, Saida, any final words, any reflection? Um. Um, first of all, um, I would, um, Aside from the FOMB's team and Treasury's team and OMB's team, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the hard work that um, the, uh, the people, the, the professionals of OATRH have performed before the CSR began and now with the implementation of the, the CR, we're, CSR, we're really looking forward because OATRH will be next. And as I told you, Arnaldo, when we started this uh, more than a year ago, it's about time. Um, that OATRH become an integral part of this rework because certainly as a back office that provides service to different agencies in matters of human resources, we certainly need more um, headcount and more um, tools to better assist in our, in our jobs. So um, we're also, it's, it, this is very important and this is part of this administration's uh, vision that our employees, not only future, employees, but our, um, our current talent uh, is paid accordingly to what the job entails in a fair and just manner. So we're, we're very excited now with the implementation starting in January 2023 of the new um, pay, uh, pay scales. And it's, it's going to be hard work. And the important thing is, I'm piggybacking a little bit on what Juan Carlos said, um, this doesn't stop here. This is a process that needs to be uh, kept going at all times because we cannot um, fall on what, what happened previously when the agencies weren't reviewing a, a, their processes. So it's very important and it's part of this, uh, of our commitment to keep improving ourselves, to keep improving our public servants experience as a whole and to prov in order to provide a better service to everybody here in Puerto Rico. Gracias. Juan Carlos? Um, the, if, when, when we stop and look back at the past five years, uh, it's, it's really hard to put together you know, everything that has happened in Puerto Rico, not only in terms of, of, of the government, the fiscal situation of the government, hurricanes and earthquakes and pandemic and, and everything. So the, the fact that we're merely having this conversation, the fact that, that, that we're doing this uh, speaks volume of, of the hard work of a lot of people, of the hard decisions that uh, have had to be made along, along the process. Uh, we, we have a unique opportunity and, and many, Many good things, many many difficult things have happened, but many good things have come together uh, in terms of, of us working together, of realizing that uh, not being being uh, uh, collaborating, not, be, not being antagonistic is it, good for, for the people of Puerto Rico, that we have the support of the federal government in the face of, of significant uh, disasters and difficulties. And, and we have a responsibility to make this work. We have a responsibility to, to make sure that what we're doing works today. And again, I keep going back to, to, to this point, uh, sets set us up, sets the people of Puerto Rico for a good future. So uh, we have the right leadership, we have the resources, we, we have the people committed uh, to, to, to this reform. We have to get it done. We have to get it done. We will. Um, well, 
uh, thank you to all of you. And, and again, thank you for your support, for your collaboration. It's been a pleasure to work with you and your teams. It's not just the three of them that you guys have plenty of people behind that work with us on a day-to-day -day basis um, and have great teams. And, and obviously, I, I have a great team as well. It's, it's not just me. So I'd like to uh, thank the governor for its commitment to the reform and thank Chairman Steele and the board members for supporting this reform and supporting our work and, and, and committing um, to, to this reform and supporting me and my team as we work with the governor in this important reform. So I, I really thankful for, for that. So gracias y, y nada. Uh, seguimos. Thank you, Arnaldo and Secretary Perez and Directors Blanco and Maldonado. I'll just say uh, kind of the obvious that this is an extraordinarily, extraordinarily exciting set of developments. It really is a first big step towards a world-class civil service system with, will, which will have huge long-term benefits for Puerto Rico. And, and I also really liked John, uh, Juan Carlos Blanco's comment that you're showing it's cool to be in government, which I think is true. And I think uh, Puerto Rico can use that. So thanks for everything all are doing. Is anybody else? Just very quickly. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your hard work and, and truly congratulations. Uh, this is important for uh, the organization that is uh, the government of Puerto Rico. It's important for its employees, but really the results are better service for our people. Uh, I personally think that this is truly uh, one of the first transformation initiatives that we as a board uh, have been able to implement, but really not the last. And as we transition from a board that has been restructuring the debt of Puerto Rico to a board that will leave, and, and hopefully very soon, as soon as possible. Um, I don't think any of us here as board members uh, want to be here any longer than we need to be. But um, the most important thing is that when we leave, uh, there's a transformation in the, where, in the way government operates, and that the board is the vehicle of change to have better government processes, better execution, and better results for the people of Puerto Rico. So thank you. Thanks, Antonio. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to say a few words if I can. Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You're clear. All right. No, uh, first of all, I'd like to just thank uh, Arnaldo and the team at FOMB and also uh, Secretary Perez and Directors Blanco and Maldonado. Uh, having spent, you know, over 20 years in state government, I can agree with you, Juan Carlos, that uh, Government service is awesome, and I've met a lot of really, really cool people. I mean, there's there's an opportunity to serve those who who really need the service, right? And, and you're making decisions and 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 operating many, many people uh, for the benefit of many, many people. I've also found that within government, there are very, very dedicated employees, and uh, many times, especially with uh, what's happened recently in Puerto Rico with, with the financial issues and the bankruptcy and everything else, the employees have been ones that have been trapped as well, right? They haven't had a lot of opportunity. Uh, they haven't had a lot of growth in their positions and their salaries, uh, so on and so forth. And what's really critical uh, when government starts operating back within its means, that those employees are addressed and have the opportunity to grow. So I really am excited that, uh, that this pilot has been successful that we've been able to make some good headway in these areas that we've started in. And I really hope the employees in Puerto Rico see that, uh, that this exercise we're going through is going to ultimately create uh, a much better benefit for them and their careers. And, and I think as, as Antonio said, um, ultimately uh, better employees, uh, employees with the skills that they need and really motivated employees provide much better service to the public, which is why we're here. Um, I look forward to working with you, uh, all of you. I've had several conversations with uh, Director Blanco and uh, Secretary Perez and, and Director Maldonado. I look forward to meeting with you uh, personally as well and talking through, uh, because as, as what's important to me is, is, is again, that, that you have the skill set that the government is operating in a rational way and that the employees have the capacity, as, as Juan Carlos talked about, that transfer 
of knowledge. It's, it's so key because, again, the board will not be here forever. Uh, that is uh, certainly not anybody's goal to have the board here forever. But we need to make sure that while we are here, we are doing everything we can to give the employees and the government the skills and the abilities to be successful. So, Governor, I appreciate your willingness to um, allow us as a board to work with your cabinet members. Uh, they, they're awesome, excellent people. Uh, you've got a great workforce. And again, I look forward to working uh, hard as we implement this. I mean, we've got a lot of other areas to look at, technology, other skill areas. I mean, as we work through the whole government, I think that uh, the, uh, the, it's, it's a ripe opportunity to make a lot of difference. Thanks, John. Anything else? Uh, thanks again, y'all. It's really, really great and important work. We move now to the other major agenda item we have this morning, which is a presentation on the progress being made in establishing and funding the Pension Reserve Trust. As we mentioned at the outset, or as I mentioned at the outset of this meeting, the Pension Reserve Trust was established pursuant to the Commonwealth Plan of Adjustment. Um, and the idea was to strengthen the funding available in the future for Puerto Rico's public pension systems. Um, the governor, I believe, would like to make some, uh, some remarks about this before we start the presentation. Thank you, Chairman. I'm looking forward to hearing about the progress that has happened in establishing and funding the Pension Reserve Trust. I am most proud of the fact that my administration ensured that the confirmed Commonwealth Plan of Adjustment protected Puerto Rico's pensioners. The oversight boards agreeing to zero pension cuts for government retirees was the correct choice, and I applaud the board for the decision. Due to this crucial concession, Puerto Rico's economic recovery is now on track, and our pensioners are protected with a $1.4 billion allocation this fiscal year for retiree and employee-related claims through the confirmed plan of adjustment. The Pension Reserve Trust will guarantee the payment of future pension obligations with more than $10 billion in contributions over the next 10 years. This will finally allow the government to guarantee current and future government retirees' retirement benefits. As per the fiscal plan projections, we expect the Pension Reserve Trust will be fully funded by fiscal year 2039. My administration welcomes the members of the Pension Reserve Trust, and we trust that their work will ensure that we can always keep our word to Puerto Rico's pensioners. We also count on their continued collaboration with the board to help the Pension Reserve Trust meet its goals in achieving a permanent solution to Puerto Rico's pension obligations. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, and Antonio would like to make remarks marks as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I think this is a really important day uh, as we're announcing the Pension Board. Uh, over many years, our pensioners, los pensionados, have been relying on a pension plan that was grossly underfunded. No había los chavos para pagarle a la gente. The board had to install PAYGO as a way to, to meet those requirements. We worked very, very hard to be able to achieve 100% uh, payment for those people that are retired from the government. But the one piece that was missing that now we have is we have a fund that will be managed by professionals that are experts uh, in managing funds and will be growing over time. It's got you know, very specific goals and objectives. And uh, finally, we're gonna have rational decision making on the funds required to make sure that our pensionados receive the payment that they earn over those uh, years that they worked so hard for the government of Puerto Rico. So congratulations, welcome, and thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, so I would like to add to Antonio's welcome and to welcome uh, Jason Fickner, uh, who is the Oversight Board's appointee to the Pension Reserve Board and Pension Benefits Council. Uh, Jason will be joined by Pension Reserve Board members Desiree Mieses, 
and Gabriel Oliveira. Uh, Mr. Fickner will provide, I believe, an overview of the Pension Reserve Trust uh, for us. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Is this on? Can't tell yet. Yeah, there we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, so good day, uh, Mr. Chairman, board members, uh, members of public, Governor, it's good to see you again. Thank you for being here. It is a pleasure to join you today to provide a report on the initial progress made by the Pension Reverse, Rever, Reserve Trust. My name is Jason Fickner, and I'm the interim chair of the Pension Reserve Board, as well as a member of the Pension Benefits Council. Uh, as the chairman mentioned uh, with me today are two of my colleagues. I'd like to give them a moment to say hello and introduce themselves before I start the formal part of my presentation. I am Desiree Mieses. Oh. I am Desiree Mieses. I have worked in the asset managed industries here in San Juan for the last 30 years, and we're all excited about this new trust that it's happening for the people of Puerto Rico, the current employees that are in the plan, and the retirees also. I'm Gabriel Rivera, a banker and a lawyer. Thank you, Governor Pierluisi, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Steele, for the opportunity also and the, all the backup you have given us. Uh, I want to excuse two of our members, uh, uh, Joshua Godban and uh, Honorable Joshua Godban and uh, Michael Finke, Professor Michael Finke. As I, we told you uh, yesterday, Governor, we have been working unbelievably well in a consensus way uh, you get you guys want to build a building and you name four engineers and architects. That's what we enjoy, that's what we know, and it's working in a beautiful way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you can go to the next slide, please. Perfect. I would like to begin my presentation by providing a little background on the Pension Reserve Trust. The Pension Reserve Trust is a new entity, there was nothing like this before, established by the Plan of Adjustment. Governor, in your opening remarks, you mentioned you were proud of this entity. You should all be very proud of this entity that you created. First, by creating this entity, you have given confidence and dignity to government employees so they know funds are being set aside to pay the, their pension benefits when they retire. Second, you've created an entity and a structure that is probably going to be a model for states and municipalities in the United States, and quite possibly even the United States Social Security Retirement Fund, which is also facing significant financial difficulties. The specific roles and responsibilities of the Pension Reserve Trust are laid out in detailed guidelines that were confirmed by the court. Importantly, to protect the fund set aside, the Pension Reserve Trust is specifically designed to function independently of the government and decisions will be made solely for the benefit of current and future retirees who are participants in the ERS, TRS, and JRS pension plans. The Pension Reserve Trust consists of two separate government bodies, a council and a board. The nine-member Pension Benefits Council oversees the collection of contributions and amounts required by the plan of adjustment and will review and approve withdrawal requests when made. The five-member Pension Reserve Board manages the investment of contributions made into the trust and will assist in reviewing withdrawal requests. Each of us on the council and the board is humbled by the opportunity to play our part in restoring trust, confidence, and financial security the government's workforce deserves and needs coming out of the Commonwealth's bankruptcy. Please turn to the next slide. The graphic on this slide provides a snapshot of the structure of the trust as created by the plan of adjustment. The top of the slide shows the flow of funds where the government is projected to make annual contributions to the Pension Reserve Trust over the next 10 years. Once certain criteria are met, the government can request withdrawals from the trust. These funds can only be used to pay pension benefits in the future to retirees in the ERS, TRS, and JRS systems, nothing else. Focusing on the bottom of the slide, you will see that both the council and board members are selected by various stakeholders. The various stakeholders include retirees, active employees, the government, and the oversight board while the oversight board is still in existence. 
the nine member pension benefits council's primary functions are to oversee and validate the contributions and withdrawals, as well as to nominate two members to the pension reserve board. The five member pension reserve board is responsible for managing the government contributions to the trust. It also oversees the investment policy. Nominees to the pension reserve board must meet certain requirements and levels of expertise. If you can go to the next slide, please. I am pleased to report to you that the Pension Reserve Trust has already achieved key milestones in three primary areas. First, all the initial members of the Pension Benefits Council and Pension Reserve Board have been selected and confirmed. There was also a joint introductory set discussion session held between both entities. Second, the Trust has been working diligently to establish operations and significant progress has been made. We continue to faithfully implement the Pension Reserve Trust guidelines conferred by Judge Swain as part of the plan of adjustment process. Also, various service providers such as legal counsel have been engaged to support us as we continue to build out the Pension Reserve Trust key functions. What we are most proud of though is the government's first contribution of more than 1.4 billion to the trust. It has been made and in fact it was made a few days early. The government is projected to make significant annual contributions to the trust over the next decade. The first transfer shows the government is serious about protecting and preserving the ability to make pension payments in the future, as the governor had mentioned in his opening remarks. The ability to accept the transfer was the first major milestone for the Pension Reserve Trust in what is projected to eventually total more than $10 billion in transfers. Finally, in addition to the service providers the Pension Reserve Trust has already engaged, there are remaining functions in the process of being retained, including an investment consultant. Please advance to the next slide. This slide provides you with a little more insight on who the council and board member appointees are. All the appointees are well credentialed to support the trust's objectives. In particular, though, I want to highlight the background of the five pension reserve board members on the right. The five pension reserve board members, of which I am one, must be well qualified and credentialed in very specific areas. I am pleased to report to you that pension reserve board members meet that standard and include one who is the former chairman of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation and current chairman of a very large small business retirement savings board in Maryland. One is the former deputy commissioner and chief economist for the Social Security Administration formally and currently chief economist for one of the largest bipartisan policy organizations in the country. Another is a former board of director member of AFAV and the vice chairman of a local private equity firm. One is a highly distinguished investment specialist and senior banking executive. And the fifth is a preeminent professor of wealth management and thought leader on pension and retirement matters. Next slide, please. On this slide, you can see with more detail the forecasted contribution so the government is expected to make to the Pension Reserve Trust over the next decade. You can also see projected contributions vary from year to year, which is driven by forecasted surpluses and the funding formula reflected in the plan of adjustment. Finally, I would like to note, the council will monitor any potential impacts to the forecasted annual funding that may result from certain events from year to year. Next slide, please. In summary, Mr. Chairman, the long-term objectives of the trust is to preserve the ability of the Commonwealth to make future pension payments. Contributions made by the government will be invested to increase the trust balance over time. You can see this growth over time in the blue line on the right. The government can, and is expected to, eventually draw down funds upon meeting a series of requirements. The creation of the Pension Reserve Trust is a legacy you all should be very proud of and having created as part of the plan of adjustment process. It is our privilege to oversee the collection, investment, and management of this precious resources that are entrusted to us. With the creation of this entity, you have preserved the ability to make retiree pension payments into the future. And I would note we've heard in various parts of the conversation this morning the word trust has come up very frequently. In this case, the pension reserve trust implies a legal vehicle uh, that is a, holds property, but we also recognize that trust means we have to build trust with the people and be transparent, be honest and faithful, and do our duties with excellence. And that is what we are committed to do. That concludes my presentation. I'll be glad to take any questions you have on the Pension Reserve Trust, its operations and accomplishments to date. Thank you for your time.
Thank you so much, uh, Jason and Desiree and Gabriel. Um, and it, it really is an exciting uh, development. I'll just, just repeat a couple of things that Jason said. One is, I think this is an innovation that's going to be studied and imitated. I guess Gabriel said this as well um, many times in, in the future. It's, it's really a hugely um, creative and important, and I'm confident it's going to be a successful um, protection of retirees' money. And, and that's the second point is, most Im more importantly than its historical significance elsewhere, is that it is going to absolutely ensure that the benefits that uh, retirees have accrued will in fact be paid. Um, and there's not going to be any, any risk that that won't be the case. So I'm very, very excited about what y'all are doing and what it means for the people of Puerto Rico. Thank um, you. Does anybody else want to make any comments? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll look forward to continuing to um, work together. As I mentioned at the outset of the, the meeting, uh, any questions or comments that we got online, we will answer online. We will answer them um, promptly. Um, and uh, with that said, I think we're at the end of our meeting. Uh, so uh, I move that we adjourn the meeting. Somebody second? I'll second. Thank you. Second. <laughs> Thank you, Antonio and Justin. Uh, if all in favor, we'll say yes. 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 Any opposed, say no. Any abstentions, uh, I can announce that the meeting is adjourned. Thank everybody for a very productive, in many respects, very exciting meeting. And uh, per usual, there will be a, a press conference a few minutes after now uh, for those who, who are interested in that. Thanks. Thanks so much to everybody.